Chemist Tea Time. Hello there and welcome back to Chemist Tea Time. In today's lesson, we are going to wrap up the topic of bonding by talking about multiple bonds and reviewing the different models that we have discussed. So far, we have only really looked at single bonds because they are the most important part of Vesper and hybridization theories. These bonds are known as sigma bonds and are the result of end-to-end -end overlap between molecular orbitals. In the case of double bonds, these consist of a sigma bond as well as what we call a pi bond. Triple bonds consist of a sigma bond and two pi bonds. Pi bonds are the result of sideways overlap of unhybridized orbitals. This does not occur with hybridized orbitals because there is not enough side-to-side -side overlap. When looking at hybridization for multiple bonds, we need to remember to leave an unhybridized p orbital for each pi bond to allow for sideways overlap. Let's look at an example in the case of ethene, shown here. When we look at the hybridization for this molecule, we need to remember that the double bond only contributes one bond for hybridization. Remember that we need to leave one orbital on each carbon unhybridized so that it can form a pi bond. Knowing this, we can determine that the hybridization of each carbon is sp2 because we will end up merging an s and two p orbitals. These three hybridized orbitals make up three sigma bonds on each carbon, two carbon-hydrogen bonds and one of the carbon-carbon bonds. The remaining unhybridized p orbitals on each carbon then pair to form the pi bond. Since the pi bonds form horizontally, it also prevents the free rotation around the carbon-carbon axis. Let's try another example. Here we can see the structure for cyanophenol. How many sigma bonds does this molecule contain? How many pi bonds? If we look closely at the structure, we can see there are 14 sigma bonds and 5 pi bonds. Remember that double bonds contain one sigma and one pi bond, while triple bonds contain one sigma and two pi bonds. Over the last several lessons, we have been introduced to several different models to describe molecular structure and bonding. The first model we were introduced to was the Lewis model. This model allowed us to qualitatively predict the arrangement of bonds as well as bond strength and length. However, as a two-dimensional model, Lewis structures are inaccurate for predicting molecular geometries, which are three-dimensional. For a more accurate three-dimensional model, we turn to Vesper, which could more accurately predict bond orientation and angles compared to Lewis models. It is also important to note that neither of these models could explain the mechanism behind why bonds form. They merely help determine structure. To learn more about how bonds form, we looked at valence bond theory, which stated that covalent bonds are formed by the overlap of atomic orbitals. The drawback to this model is that it is overly simplistic and fails to explain how more complex molecules are formed. For a more accurate look at how bonds are formed, we needed to consider hybridization and the formation of molecular orbitals. Hybridization of atomic orbitals helps explain many of the trends in bonding we observe. However, it still fails to predict some important characteristics like magnetism. For these and other properties, researchers used even more complex models such as linear combination of atomic orbitals. But that is for another lesson. I hope you all have enjoyed learning about the formation of bonds and molecular structures over the last few lessons. Until next time, thank you for watching Chemist Tea Time and have a wonderful day. Thank you.